From Phoenix, Arizona, The Cube at Catalyst Conference. Here's your host, Jeff Frick. Hey, welcome back everybody. Jeff Frick here with The Cube. We are in Phoenix, Arizona at the Girls in Tech Catalyst Conference. Um, the fourth year of the conference, about 400 people here want to come down, get a feel for what's going on. Seems to be something about Phoenix and women in tech, because we were here two years ago um, at the Grace Hopper conference, the first time we ever covered that event with, with Telly Whitney and Maria Clave, et cetera. So we're excited to be back and, and, and with our next guest, Scarlett Spring, President and Chief Commercial Officer of VisionGate. Welcome, Scarlett. Thank you, and welcome back to Phoenix. Absolutely, thank you. So for those uh, that aren't familiar with um, VisionGate, give us a little uh, 411 on the company. Absolutely. Absolutely. So VisionGate is a medical device company launching an in vitro diagnostic tool for uh, non-invasive early detection of lung cancer. And as of this year, January, we now have a licensed in a drug which could treat even the precancerous condition before you would get lung cancer called dysplasia of the lung. Okay, so you said a whole, a whole lot there. Exactly. A lot of words. So let's go through that sentence one more time, a little bit slower. That's so right. it's, it's, it's non-invasive. Yeah. So, so we're a medical device company. Okay. So there's a hardware component to the company. Okay. There's a software component to the company because we're in vitro diagnostic, meaning we have an assay. Okay. And that's a non-invasive test for lung cancer. So it's a sputum test. What does that mean, a sputum test? If you test? Cough, uh, give us a deep cough from okay. the cells of your lungs, okay. not... Um, saliva, which would come from your oral cavity, okay. but a deep cough from your lung, our device can look at those cells and make a determination whether there are abnormal cells, okay. thus leading to think that there would be cancer cells. And how would that um, process of trying to determine whether you have cancer or not happen without your technology? Uh, there isn't a test today. There's no test. The, right, sputum, uh, sputum has been looked at manually by okay. putting your uh, deep cough on a glass slide since the 1930s. Okay. And there's so much variation in data because it's like finding a needle in the haystack. Because when you give a cough, you cough up about 4 million cells, give or take a million. So for a human to do that, you exactly, right, right, that's right. it. It's extremely laborious. It's not cost effective. And once again, you're looking for a handful of cells cells, which would be diagnostic, because most of what's coming out of your lungs is saliva and white cells, because, you know, obviously it's trying to kill anything that's in there. Right, right. So um, in terms of the way the technology works, so it's, it's, is it kind of advanced kind of pattern recognition? What, what is it perfect. trying to um, do that to is a figure that out? Perfect question. It, it is exactly. Um, our um, innovation is we use machine recognition technology and we look at the morphology of a cell. What does that mean? That means the cellular features, because cell features of a cancer cell look very different from a normal cell. And you can train a computer through a series of algorithms to recognize those differences, very similar to what a human being does. So in essence, we put a pathologist in a box. And we have trained thousands and thousands, like 250,000 cells has gone into training this classifier and some of the world's best pathologists and cytopathologists have actually trained our machine. And the fact that you chose to go after lung cancer, it sounds like this would work in, because I mean, you're basically looking for anomalies. Um, That's exactly it right. It sounds like that would work for and lots of does. different uh, different things. You're exactly right. Uh, it, once you, we can train this algorithm to actually look at other cancer types. So some, you know, we're, we're still in our kind of late stage startup phase, okay. but we already have proof of concept work that is looking in urine for bladder cancer, looking at blood for circulating tumor cells, um, adenocarcinoma of the esophagus by being able to get some of the cells extracted. What we're trying to do is look at non-invasive ways because today you want to make sure that you're being cost effective. So that's the, the easiest way that you could get a cell. Uh, but you know you could use more invasive techniques to get a cell, for instance, like a pancreatic cancer. Uh, that would kind of be a real opportunity. Um, some uh, conversations that we're having with clinical collaborators, that would inquire at least um, an upper GI where you would go into the stomach, poke the wall to try to get a specimen. W what I tell uh, individuals is if you can get us a cell, we can create the classifier to ascertain whether it's normal or abnormal. 
And, and the, the end goal is to just come up with more kind of regular routine uh, with your checkup process that you're testing for these cancers to yeah, get Jeff, out ahead of the curve. It is all about early detection. Um, unfortunately, most of our costs today happen toward the end of the disease cycle. Uh, if we could invert that and actually have better early detection tools, not only would we save lives, but downstream, it would be a tremendous cost saving just to the healthcare system. Right. Very interesting work. And have Thank you always you. been involved in, in Well, it's interesting. I, I, have, I have 19 years of uh, big pharma experience. Okay. So I actually started uh, with, at, with Merck. Uh, which became AstraMerc, AstraZeneca. So I had 19 years of continuous service, and I launched uh, Prilosec in 1989 and then had the pleasure of uh, continuing my pharma career with some terrific products, uh, you know, Nexium, the oncology division there at AstraZeneca. So I, I, oncology did um, grab me, and uh, I've been very passionate about that since the, uh, the late 1990s, early 2000s. Does it ever just, like, crush you, though, that it's oncology, that it's... it's it's cancer. I always want, I always think of the, the saints that are in these wards that that are dealing with this You're every right. day. Uh, particularly at, at AstraZeneca, um, we had breast cancer, prostate cancer, and lung cancer uh, products. And one of the things that um, every October during National Breast Cancer Awareness Month, um, it was I, I would get out in the field and go and and be with our sales representatives, and it never got far from me that at the end there was a patient that was receiving therapy, and the tremendous impact that your body goes through. So at the, we can never forget that at the end of all that we're doing is there's a patient, we're trying to save a life, and uh, the work matters. Yeah, and it's a person, right? Not only a That's patient, a but it's a person, it's a mom, a, person. a sister. Yeah. A, a... I don't think any of us, you know, probably even watching this today has not been somehow impacted by cancer. Yeah, crazy. Well, let's, so let's shift gears. Sure. Get off the cancer for a minute. You had a presentation here at the, at the conference. How to fly in the face of adversity. So for the folks, unfortunately, that couldn't make it to Phoenix today, right. what's it all about? Well, flying in the face of adversity, I, I'm actually, my workshop is going to talk about three layers. Raising money for a startup that has a big idea. And I think just by the brief introduction I gave you to VisionGate, it, it's a game-changing kind of idea. Secondly, how do you go from startup to scale up? And lastly, how are you as a leader thinking about your brand and how it aligns with the mission of your company? And there isn't any given week and maybe even, even any given day that I don't balance those three things, whether I'm trying to raise money because we're still um, not revenue generating yet, whether I'm scaling the company because we've grown just 40% since, call it Thanksgiving of last year, to thinking about what's my responsibility being here today because the girls that are here are just starting their careers in technology and by them, they will be the, the leaders of tomorrow. So uh, I think it's a, gonna be a great topic. I'm actually going to allow the audience to do some prioritization. Which one of these do you wanna talk about? And we're gonna walk through some exercises of doing that. It's interesting, many moons ago, um I was involved in a, in a speaker series at Wharton, and we had David Patrick on. He's the former CEO of, of, of Schwab, Schwab's right-hand guy. Really articulate speaker, phenomenal speaker, and, and we had dinner with him afterwards. And I asked him, I said, why are you such a good speaker? And he goes, you know, I practice a lot. As, as a senior executive of a company, you know, all you do is communicate. Sure. You communicate to your investors, you communicate to your employees, you communicate to your customers. That's that's pretty much what your job is. And so I took it as a, as a serious thing and mm -hmm. I hired coaches and I practiced and now I'm pretty good at it. So it's interesting that you, that you tie that back, that you know, building your own personal brand and getting that out there and how important that is to really helping the development and the movement and the success of your company. It's true. Um, and, and if you think about your brand, if, if you do it from being a self-centered or uh, trying to uh, have it being inward focused, you're, you're gonna probably end up in the wrong place. Right. But if you do it thinking about how you would market a brand, what are the traits, the attributes that I have that I want to be known for and then that I want to try to nurture? And what it really comes down to is helping someone tap into their authenticity and their reputational power. What do you want to be known for? 
It's interesting. I'm just thinking as you're talking to get some of the nuggets, but that, that is a great nugget. What do you want to be known for? And to put that consciously out front. Right. And, and I do think, too, the, the world has shifted in kind of the sharing world that we live in. It used to be power was in retention holding, you know, you had your stack of business cards, you never let those things out of your sight, you change companies, you take your Rolodex with you. Now it's very different. The power comes actually from sharing. The more you share, the more you help others, the actually the more influence and power that you get. And that's actually some of the very things that we'll be talking about is um, whether you are just starting your career, whether you are looking to get a promotion and move up within your own company, uh, whether you are toward the end of your career and looking to like transition to boards or advisory boards or be more connected to something that um, you know, you're passionate about. In that, what are the things that you're known for that make you valuable? Uh, is it that you're gonna take on extra projects at work and, and kind of get known for someone who brings solutions to the table? Or is it the one, the person who's going to have the uncomfortable conversation? You know, the conversation that needs to be had in the room, but you're able to do it in a way that isn't polarizing, but brings everybody in to go, oh my gosh, you just articulated what needed to be said, and that created some sort of positive change. Um, I want to get at those things today in our workshop, and, and um, it should be fun. That's, that's just phenomenal, the way you just summed that up so succinctly, that you know, there's a lot of places that you can add value in the way that you work and the tasks that you choose to take on, and to be known for doing some of the dirty work, doing some of the ugly stuff, sure. and helping the whole organization get over that hurdle. Right. Scarlett. Sounds like it's going to be a great session. Unfortunately, we'll be here doing more interviews, which is not unfortunately. We love being here doing interviews, but it sounds like you're going to have a lot of fun. Good I luck appreciate with it. it. Thank you so much for the time. Absolutely. And, and Come back to Phoenix Vision again. Gate. Absolutely. Absolutely. So when, when is just your next hurdle with VisionGate? What's your next um, kind of trial? I know these uh, uh, well, the medical ones take a while. It, it is true. So we've got a couple of things that are going on right now. Hopefully there will be a, a screening opportunity coming to you soon. And uh, we're getting our drug into phase three trials. All right. Scarlett, again, thanks Thank for stopping you. by. Thank you. Appreciate it. Absolutely. I'm Jeff Frick. It's Girls in Tech Catalyst Conference in Phoenix, Arizona. You're watching theCUBE. Thanks for watching.